So yeah, we'll be talking about recurrent neural networks and also general frameworks for predicting in NLP models. And so one of the key points of NLP is that we handle lots of data that is not just a single monolithic entity, but it consists of lots of little pieces all put together. And specifically, we have lots of sequential data. And that includes things like words and sentences. That's maybe the most obvious one where we have a sequence of words that becomes a sentence. We also have, for example, characters and words. So we might want to take the characters and turn them into words, or we might want to take sentences and turn them into a document in a discourse. So there's lots of different varieties of this data that we'd like to handle. and uh, many others as well. Another feature of language is that there are long distance dependencies in language. So to give an example, we could have agreement in number or gender or something like this. So this is a syntactic property that we'd like to handle. For example, we have he does not have very much confidence in himself uh, versus she does not have very much confidence in herself. And obviously the first one, if you said herself or the second one, you said himself, this would be confusing, right? Another one is something like selectional preference. So this is an example from uh, where you could think of something like speech recognition. And it, just to give an example, if we had the rain has lasted as long as the life of the queen and the rain has lasted as long as the life of the clouds, at least according to my American English, the first two are pronounced the same way, uh, but which one you would predict in the end depends on the thing that you pick in the beginning. So obviously, uh, you know, if we had some other noun in here, we could have something very different uh, over here. And so we need to have this sort of semantic consistency between uh, the various parts of the sentence as well. And we could have very long intervening sequences in the middle. So we talked about uh, things like n-gram models before. And n-gram models obviously wouldn't be able to handle this if n was shorter than the length. And they also would be very poor at handling it, even if you made you know, n longer, because they're not particularly well suited for uh, this kind of uh, model. We're modeling these kind of phenomena. And these long distance dependencies can also be relatively complicated. So it's not necessarily as simple as coming up with a simple engineering solution. So this is a very famous example. Uh, what is the referent of it? And what I mean by referent is what uh, word does it refer to? And if we have the trophy would not fit in the brown suitcase because it was too big, uh, what does it refer to here? Trophy. Yeah, very good. So now the trophy would not fit in the brown suitcase because it was too small. Suitcase, right? So why, why are you able to answer this? Most people in the room got this right, but why are you able to? Because you have the real world knowledge or common sense, or more specifically, what do you know? Uh, context, uh, I heard size. It's not necessarily size, right? Yeah. Yeah, and you know the suitcase holds things. What well, another thing you need to know is? Yeah, exactly. For something to fit inside something else, it needs to be smaller. So, this is something that people, you know, take for granted so much that, like, you even had trouble explaining why you were able to answer this correctly. So, being able to do this automatically in a model is, you know, no trivial feat, right? So this is from something called the Winograd Schema Challenge. It's a common sense reasoning challenge. There's also a much larger version of it created recently called Winograde uh, or Winograde. Uh, so um, if, you, uh, if this seemed interesting to you, you can look at more data here. 
Okay, so before I go directly into how we handle long distance dependencies, I'd like to talk a little bit about types of prediction problems that we want to be doing in NLP. And the reason why this is ne necessary or useful here is that we would want to know what type of prediction problem we are solving in order to create a model that is appropriate to solve it or a, a decomposition that is appropriate for it. So we have different types of prediction and uh, we have uh, binary prediction, multi-class prediction and structured prediction. Up until now, I've been mainly talking about binary or multi-class prediction and binary classification is basically over two classes. So this could be something like uh, taking, I hate this movie and putting it in the negative class. So here we have positive or negative. It's only one of the two. We could also have multi-class uh, prediction, which could be over you know, any arbitrary number of classes, but these classes are kind of predefined uh, and there's a count like in innumerable number of them. There aren't so many that we couldn't you know, possibly enumerate all of them. There's a, a fixed number, be it five or uh, 50,000 or 100,000. Then structured prediction basically is where we have an exponential or infinite number of things that we could be predicting for any particular output. And this includes things like part of speech tagging or uh, translation or other things like this. Now for part of speech tagging, part of speech tagging basically would assign a part of speech to each word uh, like a preposition, verb, a determiner or noun. And we would do this for each element in the output. The important thing to notice here is that there are a finite number of outputs for each, uh, for each individual word, but put together, we have a very large number of outputs. And like, let's say we had the number, let's say the number of tags was V, and the length of the sentence was n, how many possible outputs would we have here? V to the power of n, correct. Um, so now let's say we were doing translation and we had a vocabulary of size v. Let's say our, our model was only able to generate a vocabulary of size v and the input sentence was n, how many possible outputs could we have? Yeah, it could be more. Um, the, the reasonable number of outputs that we could have is probably limited by the length of the input sentence. You know, you probably aren't going to have seven times more words in the output than you are in the input. Uh, but there are other examples where you would have that many more. Like, for example, um, if my input is tell me a story about war and peace, um, there's a story about war and peace that's 700 pages long, right? So. Uh, you have a very large output space. And you can basically say it's so large that it's infinite. So the idea behind structured prediction, it, it's called structured prediction, but normally when we think of a structure, we might think of a tree structure or a graph structure or something like this. But actually the reason why it's called structured prediction is you need to capture the structure of the output space in some way in order to make it even feasible to make a prediction at all. And in this particular case, we're capturing the structure of the output space in that it is the output is a sequence of uh, you know individual predictions that we make. So that's what structured prediction is. So there's also other two other types of prediction. One is unconditioned prediction versus conditioned prediction, or uh, unconditioned probabilistic modeling versus conditioned probabilistic modeling. The unconditioned version is predicting the probability of a single variable, P of X. So this would be things like language modeling that we talked about before. And then condition prediction is predicting the probability of an output variable given an input. So that's P of Y given X. So that would be like the text classification or the other things we did. So uh, we often talk about unconditioned language modeling or conditioned language modeling. Uh, I'm gonna talk about conditioned language modeling next class, but basically that's, whether you ask something, please generate me a book. 
uh, please generate me a sentence. And you don't really care about the specification of what kind of sentence it's going to be, as long as it's you know, natural or whatever. Um, condition prediction is where you say, please generate me a book about war and peace, or please generate me a sentence that's a translation of this sentence. Yes. Uh, so wouldn't that become the prompt, like the condition? So the condition would be, please generate me a book. For the unconditioned prediction, if you're giving that prompt to a language model. So isn't it the same thing as, you know? Uh, yeah, so it'd be, it'd be more like, please generate me please generate me a sentence or please, gener please generate me text that is natural. Um, and that would be basically the unconditioned prediction. It would be generate me, generate me text according to the distribution of all of the data that you've been trained on, more or less. Yeah. Cool, any, any other questions? Okay. So, for types of unconditioned prediction, uh, this you could also call it language modeling if you want to, but um, for types of unconditioned prediction, the one variety is left to right autoregressive prediction. Autoregressive uh, prediction basically means that you condition the next word or the next decision you're going to make on the previous decisions that you've already made. And so what it looks like is this, if this is, um, if red is the decision that we are currently making and white um, is da data that we are not conditioning on and black is data that we're conditioning on, in our first decision, we condition on nothing. Uh, on our second condition, we condition on the first word. Uh, sorry, in our second decision, we condition on the first word. In our third decision, we condition on the first and second words. That's kind of the typical decomposition uh, from left to right of a probabilistic model. Um, one example of a model that realizes this is a recurrent neural network language model, which is one of the things we're going to be talking about. Uh, another thing is a left to right Markov chain. And basically uh, what this is saying is we are going to condition on previous contexts, but we're not going to condition on all of the previous contexts. We're only going to condition on some of the previous contexts. So here is an example where you're conditioning on the two previous uh, decisions that you've made or two previous words in a language model. Um, so does anyone know an example of this? Engram language model, perfect. Yeah, uh, we also have the feed forward neural network language model, which is also maybe a variety of an engram language model. Um, I had a question on Zoom, which is, uh, this is a type of unconditioned prediction. So I think this was referring to left to right autoregressive prediction. Um, yes, in general, this would be considered unconditioned prediction because it's predicting a, all of the things that are a constituent of X are being conditioned only on other things that are part of X. So you're conditioning on the, uh, you know, on other elements of X, but you're not conditioning on something that you're not predicting. That's the basic idea. Um, any other questions? Okay. Uh, so the next one is uh, independent prediction and so basically what this does is this predicts each output independently. It's not predicting uh, based on any other uh, value here. So does anybody have an example of this? Unigram. Yeah, a unigram language model. So another way you can look at it is a, you can call this a unigram model. You could also call this uh, a nth order Markov model where n is equal to one basically. So you're conditioning on, um, uh, or sorry, zero. Uh, so a zeroth order Markov model is equal to this independent prediction. Another thing is implicitly, uh, let's say you're making an assumption that each sentence in the document is generated independently. Like, so you're training a language model where you split the document into sentences and then you only condition the output of the sentence based on what's in the sentence and not across the sentences. You could view that as kind of an independent prediction of each sentence in the document and you're making that independent assumption there too. 
uh, we do this pretty frequently for, you know, like sentence classification or something like this. Um, another thing is bidirectional prediction. Um, so basically what you're doing here is you're predicting the probability of each word given all of the other words in the sentence, including the ones on the right. Um, and one important thing to note here is that this is not a well-formed probability distribution because you're conditioning on things that uh, you haven't seen yet. And for the chain rule to work like this, you need to be generating things one at a time conditioned on all of the things that you've generated so far. Um, also practically, there's no way that you could, or there's not an easy way that you could use this to generate um, an output, for example, because you can't condition on the things that you haven't generated yet, obviously. So, um, there are ways around this, uh, which we can talk about a little bit more later, but um, uh, yeah. So basically this is not a language model um, because it's not directly allowing you, it's not a traditional language model anyway, because it's not allowing you to directly predict the probability of a sequence. Um, does anyone have an idea of an example of this? Yeah, BERT is a good example. And it's called a masked language model, <laughs> which is very confusing. Uh, but the traditional definition of a language model is something that uh, gives you the probability of a sentence and BERT cannot give you a well-formed probability of a sentence. Um, yes. Cool. So there's also conditioned prediction models and we're gonna give some examples of these. Uh, one, in a condition prediction model, you basically have uh, X, uh, source X. Uh, you can have a uh, target Y. And an autoregressive condition prediction model is basically where you condition on everything in the source. And then in the target, you condition on everything you've generated so far in the target. So uh, that looks a little bit like this. An example of this would be a sequence, sequence model or any of the conditioned uh, any of the con conditional language models that we're going to be talking about next class. And then there's also non-autoregressive condition prediction. And what this refers to is basically you condition on everything in the source at once, but you make the prediction over all of the targets independently. And we're going to be uh, talking about some sequence labeling models that are a good example of this. There's also non-autoregressive sequence sequence models or non-autoregressive machine translation models, which fall under this uh, class here. So um, hopefully this organizes things a little bit uh, and I'm gonna refer back to this in examples later. Yes. In what scenarios would the second one be helpful? Um, it's faster and easier to implement in many cases. So I think that's the, the main advantage of implementing something like this. Um, the, there's also issues that you deal with with uh, ones in the top class where if they make a mistake, they tend to repeat the mistakes. This is um, due to something called exposure bias. Uh, if you, uh, and we're gonna talk about this more later also, so it's fine if you don't understand it now, but the, the um, Basically, if you make a mistake, you might continue making mistakes because you've only trained on like correct data previously. So there's a few disadvantages to the thing on the top. That being said, this is usually better than the thing on the bottom. Yeah. Wouldn't that affect the fluency of the output? Yes, it doesn't work as well as autoregressive most of the time. Uh, we can talk about that a bit more later. I was just going to mention with self driving cars, they had a problem. The incident got offloaded a little bit and it goes nuts because they hadn't done it. Yeah, with, uh, so self driving cars uh, is another good example. So self driving cars, if they get a little bit off the road and they have only ever been trained on the, you know, on the road, uh, then they're going to be in big trouble, right? So that's the kind of uh, idea of the thing on the top. Um, the, uh, that was actually used as an example in a imitation learning tutorial by Hal Dome that introduced me to these <laughs> uh, things here, uh, self, uh, like car driving. Would be annoying if I said that Hal Dome graduated? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it would be annoying, but uh, Hal Dome graduated from, uh, <laughs> from CMUs. Okay. Uh, we, we have to have at least one Bob, uh, Bob name drop uh, for the rest of the class. Cool. Okay. Um, so 
Are we all set on that? Uh, maybe I can go into the recurrent neural networks part. Okay. So I'm going to go into recurrent neural networks. Um, so recurrent neural networks, the basic idea behind them is they're essentially tools that allow us to remember information. And a feedforward neural network, basically what it does is it takes some context, it transforms it um, into some feature representation, it makes a prediction, and it uh, gives us a label. What a recurrent neural network does is when it is calculating the feature values for a particular time step in a sentence, for example, it also conditions on the feature values for the previous time step in the sentence. So, and one, uh, one feature of this is that it always conditions on the same amount of context uh, that it has conditioned on previously. So that's kind of the defining feature of the recurrent neural network here. So this, this seems a little bit strange when you have a cycle in a graph like this, because as we talked about before, and as you're looking in the homework, you know, all of our assumptions about neural networks are uh, assuming that we uh, like have a directed acyclic graph. So like to run the forward algorithm and the backward algorithm, we need a, a graph without cycles. So how do we handle this? Um, so uh, I see the question in Zoom. I'll get back to it in a second. Um, so unrolling in time basically uh, resolves this problem for us. So if we have a sequence like this, we start out with a vector here, and we run this RNN update function that takes in the current input and the previous context, and we calculate a new context and maybe make a prediction. We could have a, uh, then in the second word, we feed in the context from here, and we uh, calculate the new context, make a prediction, and step through the sentence like this. And when I mentioned we're, we're um, conditioning on the same amount of context, maybe that was incorrect. Uh, what, I, what I should have said is we're always calculating based on the same size vector uh, from the previous time. So uh, let's say if we have this vector has three, a size three here and size four here, every single time, we would basically be inputting a vector of size three that encodes all of the information that we've seen so far, essentially. And because of that, the RNN function that we're applying here is, can always be the same function. Um, and to give a little bit more detail here, basically when we train an RNN, uh, you know, for any prediction we make, we can calculate a loss function and we can sum them all together. And we calculate this total loss. And notably, this is this unrolled graph here is a directed acyclic graph. So it's basically, um, you can see that there's actually no cycles in this graph. All of the arrows are pointing either to the right or, uh, or down, except the, the label one here. Sorry, that's a little bit confusing, but the label is, is not part of the computation graph. So, um, because this is a directed acyclic graph, our training method is basically the same. Uh, so we can just run backprop where we calculate the total loss and then we backprop back into the graph. And this will flow all the way back to, um, will flow all the way back like through here, all the way back through the RNN, through here, all the way back through the RNN, et cetera. So you can see we, we can just do the forward algorithm and backward algorithm like we would do otherwise. Um, so the parameters are tied across time. This is another important feature of RNNs or other models uh, that process sequences, which is at each time step, we are sharing the parameters uh, of the function. So we're calculating exactly the same function here and here and here and here. The only difference is that the inputs are different. And so we can process an infinitely linked sequence, you know, as much as we could fit in memory because there's no restriction. Yeah. So this is a, this, 
there aren't stupid questions, so ask any question that you want. Um, and this is not a stupid question. It's actually a very good question. Um, the, is it the case that the first word gets processed by the RNN multiple times? It's not the case that the first word gets processed by the RNN multiple times, but it is the case that it will get loss from multiple predictions. And that's actually a really important feature of the RNN. So basically, um, you get the input here, you get the context here after processing the word, and then the loss will flow back both from the first prediction and from the second prediction through here, third prediction through here, fourth prediction through here. So the first word will influence all of the future predictions. And that's actually a good thing because that means you can pass information all the way, you know, from the very beginning of the sentence to the end of the sentence and solve problems like the he himself, uh, she herself uh, thing that I mentioned over there. In one case, did you Would you have to scale the earlier words uh, compared to the later words so they contribute equally to the loss? Uh, that's another good question. Um, I think the answer to that is, what might be better to answer after I get through the later slides. I saw another question. Uh, I had a related question. So I thought that uh, although the word I influences all other predictions, but its effect would be diluting as we move forward. Yep, I'm gonna get to that too, so don't, don't worry. Um, so, great. Yeah, these are great questions. It's also great that people are asking questions that I'm gonna answer later because I have slides. So, um, so yeah, this is, this is what parameter time looks like. I just had an illustrative slide here. Um, so, the, uh, there's a number of applications of RNNs, and I'm going to talk about these before I'm going to talk about uh, the vanishing gradient of the scaling uh, that we had questions about. Um, so we can think about what RNNs can do, and they can do a number of things. They can allow us to do a number of things, such as representing a sentence, uh, reading in a whole sentence and making a prediction, representing a context within a sentence. So reading up context until that point and making a prediction over that particular point in the sentence. So to give some examples of this, if we look at encoding sentences, uh, what we do is we basically feed all of the sentences all the way through the RNN. And then we would use the last vector here to make a prediction. And so this could be used for things like binary or multi-class prediction, of course. It can also be used for things like sentence representation for uh, retrieval problems, sentence comparison, et cetera. So just to give one example of this, you could have uh, a search engine that takes in a query and it runs it through an RNN, gets a vector. And then it has a lot of documents like document one it also runs the document one through an RNN and gets a vector. It runs document two through the RNN and gets a vector. And the, um, the document that has the closest representation to the query representation would be the one you return from your search engine. So these are other examples of things that you can do with uh, RNNs or actually any kind of uh, sentence or document encoding model. Another uh, thing you can do is you can represent contexts. And so you would make a prediction over labels like this. And this can be used for things like sequence labeling, uh, calculating representations for parsing or you know, other more complicated uh, things that you might want to do. And when we use RNNs for sentence prediction, the most common thing to do is to, uh, or sorry, for context prediction. The most common thing to do is bidirectional RNNs. And basically what we do is we run an RNN in one direction, run an RNN in another direction, concatenate them together and make a prediction. And so I talked about a couple of varieties of prediction before, or no, actually, sorry, let me go to the next slide before I get to that. Um, so we can also do language modeling with RNNs. And the way language modeling with RNNs works is you would essentially um, take an RNN 
and conditioned on the previous word, we would have like a start of sentence token to start us out. Um, we would predict uh, the next word like this. And so basically this is like a tagging problem uh, where each tag is the next word. So each tag is the next word that we want to be predicting. Um, oh, sorry, I wanted to give a quiz, but I gave it away. <laughs> Going to the next slide. So, um, however, there's an important difference uh, between language models and tagging models. And I think we can go back to each of the models that I talked about before. So let's go back to the bidirectional RNN and what variety of model is this according to the prediction tasks that I talked about? Is this an autoregressive model? Uh, so we talked about conditioned versus unconditioned prediction. Which one is this? Yeah, this is conditioned prediction because we're predicting a part of speech sequence given in uh, Y given in sentence X. And is this, an autoregressive uh, conditioned prediction model or a non autoregressive condition prediction model? Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I heard mostly non, so I'll go with non. <laughs> yes, it is a non autoregressive condition prediction model. Why is it non autoregressive? Yeah, it doesn't take output as input. So nowhere are we taking the predicted labels and giving them as, uh, giving them as input to the RNN and making predictions on the next labels. If we wanted to do that, what would we do? And actually, maybe that's a little bit tough. Uh, we, could, uh, we could think about what we would do here and that might be easier. What would, we, what would we do in this model if we wanted to make it an autoregressive model? Yeah, feed the label back in. So we would take the label that we would predict here and feed it back in uh, to the RNN here. Maybe concatenate the embedding of the label with the embedding of hate, of label one with hate. So um, we could also do that in the bidirectional RNN, but, um, but we wouldn't be able to concatenate it with uh, like this RNN. Uh, we wouldn't be able to concatenate it with uh, the backwards RNN. We'd only be able to do it with the forwards RNN because we can't condition in both uh, both directions at once when we need to make predictions. Yeah. If we ignore the sorry, Yeah, so it's only an autoregressive model if you take the output that you're predicting and feed it back in. So if you just feed in the context, that's actually an interesting point because in RNN, you're feeding in something that you predicted previously. Like namely, when I say predicted, it's you calculated previously, um, but it really only becomes an autoregressive model if you uh, take the thing that you're actually predicting in the output and feeding it back in. So the language model is also an autoregressive model uh, here because you're taking the thing that you previously predicted and feeding it back in. Yes. So what's the difference between a bidirectional uh, RNN and bidirectional prediction in mass language modeling? Um, very good question. Uh, I am debating whether to talk about that now or later. Um, but uh, basically, there is a variety of, uh, of bidirectional language model. It's not actually a language model for the reason that I mentioned before, but you know, a bidirectional um, contextualized prediction of words. So there's something called context to VEC from 2016. And basically what it does is it feeds in all of the previous words in all of the, into a forward RNN, all of the next words into a backward RNN, uh, namely in LSTM, but uh, a type of RNN. And it predicts the word in the middle. It was actually one of the like precursors to BERT uh, that very few people know about. But um, the big difference there is um, if you're familiar with BERT, if you're not, we'll talk about it in future classes, but if you're familiar with it, um, 
BERT basically masks out the input and then tries to predict the masked out input and the output, um, which means that the previous words and the next words can interact with each other. If you're using an RNN, you can only feed the previous words into the forward RNN and the backward, the following words into the backward RNN. So you, um, uh, the following words can only interact with each other and the previous words can only interact with each other. So you have that separation. So that's one of the contributions of the BERT paper actually. Um, cool. We'll get into that in more detail later. Cool. Uh, so yes. Um, another important thing to know about uh, RNNs is vanishing gradients. And it's not just about RNNs, it's actually about any neural network that you uh, want to use. And um, I, I see there's a couple questions in, uh, in Zoom about RNNs and LSTMs, and I'm gonna talk about that just now. So uh, vanishing gradients, um, one issue with gradients in neural networks in general, not just RNNs, is the more calculations you run them through, the more diluted they become essentially. So they become more uh, like, for example, like let's say you have a loss term here and you calculate the loss and then you back propagate it through multiple layers of RNNs. Um, in most formulations that you come up with of, of an RNN, basically the gradients will get either smaller and smaller or bigger and bigger as you go back. Um, and usually smaller and smaller is a larger problem. Uh, bigger and bigger can also be a problem, but uh, either way, the gradients will kind of uh, diminish, vanish or explode as you go farther back uh, through the network. And this is an issue because if we talk like solely about vanishing gradients, that means that if we have a loss function at the end of the sentence, and we back propagate all the way to the beginning of the sentence, even if there's a really important word at the beginning of the sentence, that word will get a very small gradient and won't be updated very much uh, compared to the other words in the sentence. So uh, this is particularly, and wh why does this happen? Um, one reason why this happens, the best maybe illustration of this is uh, of a tan h function. So I talked about the tan h function before uh, is a, non, a variety of nonlinearity. And the tan h function uh, looks a little bit like this. This is the actual uh, function itself. Um, but if you look at the gradient, It looks a little bit like this. And the maximum here is one. So anywhere except, uh, if the input is anything except a zero, your gradient is going to decrease. And especially if you're far away from zero, like x equals zero, um, the gradient could decrease a very large amount, right? And so if you do this one time, then the gradient might decrease by tenfold. But if you do this, you know, through, uh, like a 20 word sentence or something like that, it might decrease you know, a huge amount and just completely disappear. So because of this, actually RNNs uh, tended to not be very good for text classification, for example, because what text classification or using RNNs like this for text classification tended to not be very effective because basically um, the word hate would have a very diminished gradient by the time you got to the actual label prediction at the end of the sentence. So um, this is a problem, not only in RNNs, but also in other varieties of neural networks as well. So if you go through many, many layers of, uh, you know, of some varieties of neural networks, you have problems. So a solution to this uh, that was proposed uh, in 1997 is called LSTM. And the basic idea, which, which also applies to other varieties of neural networks, is there's essentially one connection that you can make that doesn't modify the gradient, and that's addition. So addition of uh, two things together will not modify the gradient. It'll just add the two gradients together. And so if you have additive connections between time steps, that allows you to 
uh, avoid this gradient vanishing problem. And you can also have gates to uh, control uh, uh, the information flow. And so what, a, what an LSTM looks like is you have this uh, C, this is called the cell or the memory cell and H is the hidden state. So H is kind of the more typical way of creating an RNN. Um, but the memory cell basically has this additive connection where the memory cell at the next time step is the addition of the memory cell at the previous time step plus some incoming information. And so specifically what we do is we have uh, three or four gates, depending on the variety of LSTM we're using, but uh, we have this update gate, which basically has a TANH nonlinearity in it. We have the input gate, which is a gate between zero and one uh, that decides how much we want to be updating for each of the individual inputs. And we have an output gate, which decides how much of the cell value we want to be outputting to, uh, to the uh, next hidden state. So um, there's also a variety of this with something called the forget gate. It wasn't in the initial LSTM, but it was added shortly after. And most uh, implementations use that. But anyway, the most important thing here to know is that this additive connection is what is the really important thing in the LSTM. Uh, there's also things like this uh, that are used for multi-layer networks called residual connections. They're the exact same thing. We have basically uh, some sort of update that a neural network layer uh, like adds and it's uh, added to the previous input. So it's a similar idea. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more later, but basically you can view LSTMs as similar to residual connections if you're familiar with residual connections. Okay, yes, question. Um, so basically, TANH and sigmoid are very similar. Uh, the only, the major difference between them is whether they're between zero and one and or minus one and one. And within the LSTM, the sigmoid is used when it's supposed to be a gate, like either letting through or not letting through information. And the TANH function is used when you're calculating an actual value. So basically what you can see is that the update um, here is calculating an actual value. And then the input is uh, telling you whether it's a gate that tells you whether to let that update through or not. So that's basically the distinction between them in, uh, in the LSTM. And it's also pretty widely used other places as well. Cool, any other questions? Okay. So, um, what is the initialized value of the starting C? Um, you can do it one of two ways. Uh, that, that's a question on Zoom. You can do it one of two ways. Uh, it can be set to zero or it can be set to a, a learnable parameter. So either, either is okay. Great. Okay, so I'm gonna go a little bit into uh, like understanding RNNs. Um, I, this paper in 2015 was a very interesting one to me. It kind of gave me an insight into what RNNs can learn. So I think it's still uh, worth looking at. This is kind of small. You might not be able to see it on the slides here. You could take a look on your, um, on your computer later if you, you don't see them. But basically what this does is this looked at every node in learned in an LSTM and it uh, has the negative values in blue and the positive values in red or vice versa. I don't remember which is which, but it's not really important. Um, and it's doing character level language modeling over either natural language, namely English, or uh, code, namely C, yeah, C, or C++. Um, so, you can see that each of the individual nodes in the LSTM can learn a uh, like can learn some salient things. So, for example, there's one cell that's sensitive to the position in the line. So, when you start getting to the end of the line, it starts becoming negative. Uh, notably, this is not constant. It's not just counting the characters, but it is actually like measuring the progress through the sentence. Um, this is another example of a cell that turned on inside a quote. 
So it was trained on lots of books and there's lots of quotes in books. And so when you're inside a quote, it becomes positive. When you're not in a quote, it becomes negative. And that kind of makes sense because uh, what, what can you think of that would be the difference between the language when you're inside a quote or not? Any ideas? Something very obvious, yeah. Yeah, exactly. First person or third person. So you're much more likely to be speaking in first person. Um, you might be much more likely to be speaking more casually inside a quote, for example. So there's lots of differences. So nothing explicitly told the LSTM, now you're inside a quote, now you're not inside a quote. This is something it just learned in the process of learning how to language model. Um, there's also other ones uh, like activating with inside an if statement. Um, sensitive to the depth of an expression in, in code. Um, notably, there's lots of other ones that you can't really interpret uh, that easily. And these are probably doing things like just you know, modeling within individual words, what should we be predicting next, et cetera. Um, one important thing is uh, the additive connections in the LSTM make it, uh, make it particularly useful for this. So um, there's no, multiplication or no matrix multiply going on within the LSTM. And because it's purely additive and passing information on as is, it makes it much more likely to, uh, to have this be uh, you know, interpretable in the cell state. Um, I had a question on Zoom, which is, uh, what does it mean for a cell to turn on? It means for the value of the cell state to be highly high, you know, basically uh, one, uh, one, two, three, four, five. So here are some other examples. Um, this is an example from Xi et al. 2016, where they demonstrated that a model that learned how to uh, like do neural machine translation basically uh, counted the length of the sentence. And I talked about this last time, but basically a model that learned how to do uh, language modeling over Amazon reviews learned one node for like the sentiment of the sentence. And that also makes sense, right? Because if the sentiment is positive, it will tend to be positive. So you'll continue predicting positive words. Um, so that also makes, uh, makes sense as well. Okay, uh, any questions about this? Yes. So uh, do the embeddings produced by kind of like vanilla RNNs versus LSTMs look very different? Um, I, yes, they do. I don't know if there's anybody who has like really carefully looked into this, but I think another thing is that vanilla RNNs that don't have these sort of additive connections at all really just aren't anywhere near as good at modeling language because of the vanishing gradient problems. So um, I've, I, I've compared them before and it's just like no contest whatsoever. So I think because of that, it's not going to be as interesting because RNNs are just going to be so much worse. I think it would be more interesting to compare to like competitive but very different model structures. Like let's say a very strong LSTM language model versus a strong transformer model. What would be the differences of the things they uh, find? Um, I had a question on Zoom, which is uh, when there's no matrix multiplication in the LSTM, is this a reference only to the memory cell or the entire LSTM? Yes, that was a reference only to the memory cell. Um, sorry, this is a little bit hard to interpret, but this is basically representing a matrix multiplication here. So there are matrix multiplications in all of the gate um, calculations of the gates in the uh, tan H functions, except this one. Um, but uh, yeah, it's only in the memory cell. And, Normally when people investigate the characteristics of an LSTM, they're investigating the characteristics of the memory cell, not the hidden state. Another interesting thing um, from as early as 1992, uh, sorry, go ahead. So this, uh, the cell output was the C, was it CD that, that we're tracking here? Yes, this is, this is a single element of the vector CT. And um, here they actually have two elements of the vector CT. So they have unit 109 and unit 334. 
This was trained with a huge vector. And then, oh, so another thing, actually, if people are interested in this sort of analysis, what they do to find these is basically they set up a prediction problem where you use a single unit and you try to regress to the label that you're interested in. So here they would take all of the units, all of the 512 units and try to regress to the length of the sentence. And um, the thing that had the highest correlation with the length of the sentence is the one they're displaying on the figure here. So that's a good analysis technique if you're interested in doing these kinds of plots. Um, so RNNs, uh, as early as 1992, People have demonstrated that RNNs uh, can be used as Turing machines. So basically they're capable of any computation. Uh, and there's some conditions on this, like they need to be uh, infinitely wide or something like this. And then recently, um, I, I didn't uh, look up the references and put them on here, but I can send them along if people are interested. Recently, there's some results that try to make this result a little bit stronger and basically say um, finite capacity RNNs can be a Turing machine with a tape length of X or, um, or other things like that. So um, long story short, an RNN, which also includes LSTMs, can calculate any function we want to be able to calculate. So this is kind of similar to uh, the discussion that uh, feed forward neural networks can calculate any function that we would like uh, and they, um, sorry, uh, recurrent neural networks can compute any computation we would like to do. Um, feed forward neural networks can calculate any function from that we would like to uh, calculate. And so it's not a question of whether a neural network can do it. A neural network, including a very simple recurrent neural network can process language. Uh, perfectly because, you know, if a computer can do it, uh, then, you know, uh, a, a Turing machine can do it and RNNs can be a Turing machine. So it's more a problem of whether we can actually learn a model that is able to do that or not uh, from the data and the computational resources and the optimization algorithms we have. Cool. Um, so, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, efficiency and specifically mini batching for RNNs. Um, this is a little bit more complicated than what we need to do for, um, uh, for feed forward networks, but I'll, I'll just go through it kind of quickly because uh, you need to know what is happening under the hood, but most neural network toolkits do this for you. Uh, so it makes it relatively easy. So um, mini batching makes things uh, much faster as I talked about last time, but uh, mini batching in RNNs is harder than in feed forward ne networks. Uh, the reason why is each word depends on the previous word and sequences are of various length. So what we need to do is like, let's say we have sequences of different lengths. We'll need to do things like padding. And uh, when we calculate a loss, for example, in a language model, we need to take a mask and mask out any predictions of the like extra padding that we added. And that will give us the losses and we take the sum of them. This becomes more complicated when we're dealing with uh, bi-directional networks because a bi-directional network, we basically have to do an update uh, based on these two uh, inputs here and then undo the update. So we're actually starting from like a zero vector or whatever vector we would be starting from if uh, to account for this. So the backward, recurrent neural network or whatever is more complicated uh, when we implement this. So this is a pain if you have to do it manually. Luckily, most neural network toolkits now don't, uh, don't require you to do that. So you don't even have to think about it. But I think it's worth knowing that they're doing this sort of stuff under the hood. Um, another thing that you should be aware of, uh, you'll, you'll see this in many modern toolkits for handling sequences. Like one example would be FairSeq, uh, a sequence sequence modeling toolkit does this automatically. And basically, um, if we use sentences of very different lengths, too much batting, padding and sorting can result in decreased performance. So basically what would happen is you would have, um, let's say you have a batch of uh, 50 sentences or something like that. 
And most of the sentences are of length three or four, but you have one sentence that's of length uh, 80. So then you would be padding all of these three and four length sentences up to you know, 80, which would be a waste of a lot of time. And so uh, what you do is you um, sort sentences so that similarly linked sentences are in the same batch and then concatenate them together in one batch. Um, this has to be done for all kind of like sequence models. So it's true for transformers or whatever else we'll be using later too. Yes. Um, we spoke about the requirement to kind of workshop for training data uh, in a previous class. Yes. How does that interact with this? Do we have a couple buckets that get to work with one or is that kind of always a problem? Really, really good question. So in the previous class, we talked about the requirement to shuffle the training data. Um, to be actually even more precise, when you're doing stochastic gradient descent, um, the ideal thing to do is to sample each individual example with replacement from the, uh, from the training corpus. So basically every single time you sample a new sentence. Um, when you're doing batching like this, that warps that distribution, right? So it, it makes it so that you're suddenly uh, updating on 50 long sentences or 50 short sentences at the same time. What's even worse is that there's something that's often used in NLP and other uh, machine learning things called gradient clipping. Um, and what it does is it basically takes the gradients and it uh, reduces them down to uh, a particular size, like may maybe makes the norm of the gradients five or something like this. And what this prevents is it prevents you from making like too big of a jump in one direction and um, in making training unstable. Um, so there's all kinds of things that move us away from the ideal of updating, like the ideal gradient updates. And this is one of them. So this certainly affects uh, accuracy. I actually have a paper that we wrote a while ago on this and the kind of sorting uh, does hurt your accuracy a little bit, but it also speeds up training a lot. Um, one way that you can solve this uh, is I talked about last time about like the computation batch size versus the um, the computation batch size versus the learning batch size. So you can update on like four batches or eight batches, all of which have different lengths. That gives you like a more even distribution of lengths uh, across uh, different sentences. So. Long story short, this is not the ideal thing to be doing from the point of view of learning, but it is much faster and much less late, wasteful. So a lot of people do this. Yes. So I, I guess that sorting would definitely impact performance, but uh, padding would just be a time issue. Uh, you're padding is just a time issue. So if you shuffle um, or if you randomly sample sentences and then you put them together and you pad them, then that's fine uh, from a learning perspective. Yeah. Yes. Oh, do you have uh, positions where, do you have uh, situations where sentences are context dependent? Uh, yes, and then it's even harder, right? Because now you have really, really long sequences. Like let's say, um, let's say for example, you want to generate a Wikipedia article. Um, that's 10,000 words or something like that. And it, how do you handle that? Uh, we're gonna be talking about that near the end of the class on modeling long sequences, but Basically the big challenge there is how can you fit things in memory? Um, and yeah, it's a challenge. It, it's not easy to do. Yes. It's worth pointing out maybe that, you know, most techniques have just looked at sets of sentences without the sentences between them because of that. Yeah, and um, it, 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 as Bob pointed out, it's very common to, you know, ignore the context. Although I would say that um, for things like language modeling, now you can't get competitive language modeling performance without considering the context because then um, you totally lose the topic every sentence and topic is really important to decide your next content. So a lot of things like tagging will be independent, but a lot of things like language modeling will definitely consider context. Cool. Um, another thing is um, if you're, Using a neural network toolkit, um, you don't really need to know the, the details of the internals of how this works, but there are very optimized implementations of common operations to use. 
Uh, so for example, LSTMs are actually quite complicated. You saw all the operations inside them and how to implement them ideally is not like trivial. Um, so the people, the good people at NVIDIA basically fixed this for us and went in and hyper-optimized the LSTM. So uh, you can now run an LSTM in both directions really fast uh, with minimal delay. Um, the problem with this though is like, let's say you want to try a slightly different LSTM now. Uh, that makes things a lot harder uh, because you, you can either use the hyper-optimized NVIDIA LSTM or you can use your own super slow LSTM. And you know, which, <laughs> which one are people going to choose? The, uh, the like, the standard one or your one that's slightly better, but not as optimized. Okay, um, cool. Oh, so actually, sorry. Yeah, I would forgotten about this, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about handling long sequences in RNN. So um, we're gonna talk a lot more about this later, um, but sometimes we'd like to capture long-term dependencies over long sequences like words and full documents, and this might not fit in GPU memory. Um, a first pass way of doing this uh, that is done uh, is called trun truncated backpropagation through time. And so what you do is you backprop over shorter segments like this. Um, and so you, you do the first pass like this, you calculate your loss function, you backprop through, uh, I hate this movie. Um, and then what you do is you save only the final state and reduce and remove all of the rest of the computation graph from memory, and then pass that final state on as the first state of the following sequence like this. Um, so basically what this does is this allows you to still condition on the previous context, but it doesn't allow you to backprop into the previous context. So it doesn't allow you to further update any information that you would have gotten from the first state of the RNN in the model parameters. So um, it's kind of a halfway solution, but it's still a good solution in many cases. Um, any any questions about this? Yeah, exactly. So it won't contribute to the learning. It will contribute to the learning of the parameters. So this state here will contribute to the learning of the parameters from these four RNN functions. And all of the losses you get from the second sentence will contribute to these four RNN functions, but they won't contribute to these four RNN function updates, basically. Cool. Okay, so the final thing I'd like to talk about is um, RNN variance. This is uh, maybe not super important, but maybe interesting. Um, and so, in addition to LSTMs, uh, there's something pretty widely used called gated recurrent units or uh, GRUs or GRUs, if you want to call them that. Um, is it, does anyone know what it is to be eaten by a GRU? Not that. Okay. <laughs> there, there's an old uh, old text uh, text based adventure game, uh, Zork. Uh, where you get eaten by group. Never mind. Okay. And every once in a while, I need to test how young my audience is. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have a, a simpler, uh, the GRUs are a simpler version uh, that preserves additive connections uh, between the, um, uh, between previous states and next states, um, but they have fewer parameters than the LSTM and are, are faster to calculate. And basically the way it works is um, you have an additive connection between the previous uh, thing and um, a nonlinearity that you can add in. And then you have the ZT, which is the gate that tells you whether you are going to use the previous thing or uh, the updated parameters here. And there's actually a, um, a parallel between this and um, some other things you might know about. So you have an additive connection or you have a gate and you have either time or layers. And 
the additive connection, like the example of an additive connection between time is an LSTM, a gating function uh, over time is GRUs. And then if you're familiar, if you've taken like another deep learning class, you might've heard of residual connections, which are additive connections between layers. And then there's also highway networks, which do a similar like gating thing to what the GRUs are doing here uh, between layers. So, um, uh, if you're if you've taken a deep learning class but not an NLP class, you might be familiar with these concepts. So I, I thought I'd make the connection. Um, one interesting thing about GRUs is because GRUs are now they're adding this either or thing where you either have an additive connection or you have a nonlinear connection here. And because of this, GRUs actually can't easily do things like count the number of words in the sentence. Um, I mean, they can, but they would have to do it in a very convoluted way. Um, in LSTM, just by keeping the gate open and always updating and adding one, you can easily count the words in the sentence. So there are some things that LSTMs definitely uh, are better at. Um, this is kind of a fun paper uh, where basically they automatically searched for the best uh, recurrent neural network they could come up with. And this is it. Hope you remembered it because I'm not gonna show it anymore. <laughs> um, no, just kidding. It's super weird if you look at it, it's like add and then you have a bunch of identity functions and stuff like this, but this worked a bit better than LSTMs. Another thing, um, this is, uh, there's a lot of different variations of this. Um, this is just one example, but basically if you have a very long sequence, um, you sometimes will want to decrease the length of the sequence as you go through multiple layers of processing. One very stereotypical example of this is uh, speech processing, where you have a whole bunch of frames of speech, um, but like four frames or seven frames or 12 frames correspond to one word. So basically you start out by processing each of the frames to extract the acoustic characteristics, and then you gradually reduce the scale of uh, the representations you're learning as you get on to uh, later layers in the network. So this is an example with the scale uh, where every layer you reduce by two. So basically on the first layer, you run over every single input. On the second layer, you run over every other input, but you feed in um, the first and the second, and then the third and the fourth, and then the fifth and the sixth. And then uh, in the next layer, you do the same thing. So you basically decreased from like four to two to one uh, for every four inputs. Um, uh, I'll get to that in a second. So this is, uh, this is called striding. Um, so striding is basically where you uh, reduce the number of input, the, the number of representations you have as you go through the layers of the network. It's also very widely used in uh, convolutional uh, neural networks, for example. Striding and, and stuff like that is definitely used in convolutional neural networks. Um, it's also used in uh, like character based models some of the time. Uh, the main reason why it is used is because. Um, I, I, my impression, I, I'm not 100% sure of this, but my impression about the main reason why it's used is for computational reasons more than for uh, like adding a, a good bias into your learning algorithm. Because uh, if you're running a big transformer over every character in a Wikipedia document, that's not gonna be feasible, right? So you start out by processing the characters, extracting the words and then uh, scaling down. Uh, so. Um, I have a, a couple questions. Um, in the second layer from the bottom, is the input just the hidden state or do they uh, skip inputs? Um, so there's multiple ways to do striding. So um, in this particular example, it's taking in the left side and the right side. But another thing that you can do is like just take in the even numbered states or the odd numbered states, for example. So um, that's another uh, thing. And what are the arrows going from X1 and X2 to the square above them? 
So the way you would actually implement this is by concatenating together the outputs of these two neural networks and feeding them in as the input to the next one. So basically uh, you would be concatenating, uh, concatenating two and then feeding it into a single RNN. Um, cool. So the last one, this is a, this is a kind of a curiosity that nonetheless I found was kind of interesting. This is, um, uh, basically it allows, gives you the ability to learn a model that forgets some part of the, uh, of the input that you're processing. And it will forget only the bottom part and, uh, and maintain the top part. So the idea about why you would want to do something like this is, uh, in human language processing, we basically have uh, a lot of recursive structure where you know you can be processing very deep into uh, into a phrase. So, like uh, for example, the the typical example of a thing that's very hard for humans to um, to process is the dog, the dog, the cat, the bird. The dog, the cat, uh, sorry, the bird, the cat, the dog chased eight or something like that. Eight to chase. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to produce. But basically, like, um, you have like the bird or the. <laughs> the dog, yeah, okay. The dog. The cat, the bird um, escaped. No, I, I need to start with the bird, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the bird, the cat, the dog chase. Eight died, or something like that. So this is the cat, the dog chased. Um, so the dog chased, and then the cat, the the dog ate. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> it's just too it's too hard. But basically, you can look up center embedding on Wikipedia, and you'll find lots of examples of this. But Basically, yeah. Well, the, the point is that it's perfectly legal from a grammar point of view. From a grammar point of view. People can't do it. Yeah, it's perfectly legal from a grammar point of view, but people can't do it. But anyway, there's lots of hierarchical structure in language. And the idea behind this RNN is that you basically build up context for the current hierarchical structure you're processing. And then when you're done processing that hierarchical structure, you delete it. And the goal of creating this RNN was basically to do some form of uh, like grammar induction. And you, by looking at how much uh, information the model was keeping around, you could tell how deep you were in the hierarchical structure. Um, the Q, the Q max or cumulative max function here, it, basically what it does is it, um, it finds the point where uh, you reach a certain threshold and then everything after that certain threshold um, is deleted. Uh, I, I won't go into the details now because we're over class time, but uh, you can take a look at the paper if you want. Cool. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Uh, we're, we're at time now, so I will finish up, but I'm happy to take questions afterwards. Thanks a lot.